Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Rockman Power Hour, a podcast where we talk to the most interesting people in the world of pop culture. And this week on the show, this guy's a legend. Started out with a band called Slipknot. Then he had a band called Stone Sour. And now he's got a solo career. And he's done a couple of things in between all of that. And we're going to unpack all of it today. Corey Taylor is our guest this week on the Rockman Power Hour. All right, welcome back to the show. Um, Ryan, my co-host, extraordinaire, living in the fridge for the last few weeks, loving it. Oh, yeah. um, you got all the heartbeat hot sauce in the world behind you. Uh, listen, dude, Corey Taylor, cool as that. Dude, Corey Taylor was one of, we'll, we'll discuss in it, we'll discuss in it, but he's pretty much one of the first rock stars I think I've ever had a lengthy conversation with. And uh, just a little a little background of, of how the hell that happens. I, uh, I knew two ladies that knew the band and uh, had hung out with them previously and stuff. They weren't just shoving out backstage passes to just anybody. Right. So I, I, I kind of felt like a high-functioning Forrest Gump of how the fuck I got back there in the first place. <laughs> but uh, it was just one of those lucky things. And then later on, my friends would embrace them and... Shout out to Dave, Mike, and everybody that we used to uh, crowd around a discman outside of school dance. So when everybody was listening to Love Inc., we were listening to Surfacing, you know. Yeah. For a pra- pra- like, you know, I didn't smoke, but I, so I watched people smoke and I listened to metal music. Today's episode means a great deal to me, and uh, I'm so glad that we do this show. Yeah, me too. And um, Corey's one of these guys that, uh, you know, I've had, the, I've had the, uh, the, the pleasure of chatting with him before. Um, he's just a really, really nice guy. He's exactly what you see is what you get. There's no bullshit. There's no airs about him. Um, and he's a fan. He's a fan of music. He's a fan of pop culture. He's a fan of movies. He's a superhero fan. And we talk about that. We talk about his love of superhero films. And, um, and it made you and I just want to talk to him more about that. Like I would have loved to have, you know, said, had an episode where we just unpacked the flash movie and all these things. So, uh, it was a really, really nice treat to have him on the show. And, uh, I, and he was always somebody that I knew one day we would get on the show. And, uh, and the fact that we have him on this week is really, really a, a, a big, big treat. So, um, very excited to have Corey Taylor with us, but, uh, you know what I'm excited about too, Ryan, the fact that heartbeat hot sauce is on this journey with us. And if you have not tried heartbeat hot sauce yet, you are missing out. I'm telling you, one of the greatest hot sauces that I've ever tried. And that's the reason why we wanted them involved with our podcast. And we're so happy where we were able to partner up. They help to uh, to help us keep the lights on. And also they provide us with um, this great promo code for all of you. And that's one of the things that makes me the happiest is that we're able to share their incredible product with you at a discount. So if you use our promo code Rockman20, that one right there, that'll give you 20% off your entire order, and you can use that code over and over again. So thank you, Heartbeat Hot Sauce. It's really, really wonderful stuff, and we appreciate that they're here with us on this journey. Also, a big thanks to Studio House Designs, uh, one of the greatest t-shirt companies in the world, and um, we love them. And I'm waiting on uh, on some stuff as well as you. Uh, but There was that Lost Boys drop that came out a little while ago, and um, I'm looking forward to getting that. There's the Midsommar one that, that's coming too, so... Uh, expect us to be looking very fresh this summer in our Studio House Designs, and you can as well. Just go to studiohousedesigns.com. Okay, Ryan, Corey Taylor. This is cool. Um, was really, really happy you were on board for this one. So was I. I, I know, and, and I know it meant a lot to you. And uh, at one point, man, we just sound like three friends hanging out, and that's what I love the most. That, to me, is what a, po- a podcast should be. It should be where you're really just having a great conversation with someone and it can go in any direction. And it really does with this one. So here you go, folks. The legendary Corey Taylor. Um, Dude, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Um, You know, what I've always said about you, the one word that, that describes you is passion. And there's nobody that can deny that you are to me. It's, it's, it's passion. And then if I'd add two more words, it would be work ethic because you, that yeah. um, what at this point, 
I mean, you don't have anything to prove. Uh, you've said it that you have no fear when it comes to music, none. Right. And that's always been obvious. Um, at this point, it just seems like you're having a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I mean, I hope it looks like that because sometimes it's not like it's, you know, you know how it is. I mean, yeah. On the other side, you know, there's so much that the fans don't see. They see maybe about five percent of what actually goes into actually making this work, making it happen. I mean, you know, band dynamics. I mean, I was just talking to the guys in Slipknot today about this, man. I mean, we've been doing this together. I mean, I've been in the band for 26 years, and those guys predate me, you know, yeah. some of them. And, and it's just about, you know making sure that you communicate, making sure that you're all on the same page and making sure that, you know, you get something out of what you do, you know? Right. So I guess at this point, I only, you know, since day one, we've only really done what we've wanted to do, you know? And because we've kind of continued that, whether it's with Slipknot or, you know, when I was doing stuff with Stone Sour or, you know, my solo stuff, it, I, you know, I only do what I want to do you know um and i've been very fortunate to have a fan base who's kind of encouraged me to do that you know right. i mean mm -hmm. some people kind of get locked to the whims of you know a, of a fandom and then they're just kind of dragged in the direction almost like you know you're trying to get a, a rope away from a dog man they're gonna they're gonna just you know get in yeah. their teeth and they won't, won't let it go but for me man whether people dig it or not, they've always been like, they've given me the tether right. to go out on a limb because they know that anything that comes out of me, I'm immediately going to share with them. If I, if I love it, they're going to, they're going to hear it, you know? So, I mean, I, I'm just really lucky, dude, you know, like I've, I've been extremely lucky and I'm, I'm very grateful for that, that, you know, that I've still got, you know, millions of ears out there that want to hear what my dumb ass has to say and do, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a pretty rad place to be in. Definitely. Uh, Corey, I, I just got to say, um, you were one of the first rock stars I ever met back in the day. There's no way you remember this, but you yeah. guys played Montreal in, um, 2000 and it was Paul Gray's birthday. And, uh, you oh, was that uh, the club? Was I, was that when we were outside? Hanging no, out with it was everybody. At the, it was at the Metropolis. Oh uh, well, you guys are always great. That was that round too. place. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. And, and yeah. There, and there was this. Uh, you guys played Music Plus earlier that day. And right. Yeah. Wow. These two friends of mine, they had met you guys previously, and they, uh, you know, they're like, "Oh, we're going to see this band called Slipknot." I'm like, "What's that?" And they show me a poster. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the next day, the the night before you play Montreal, you're on Conan O'Brien, and you right. come out, and you're just this art, this circus act of uh of violence <laughs> and it was it was something really to take in and then the next day i'm like watching you guys in front of me and i'm just watching you guys massacre not only the audience but each other on stage and uh because because my friends had met you previously we ended up uh backstage and uh i i had this wonderful talk with you about south park because <laughs> south park bigger longer on cut had just come out and we were singing super i'm super thanks for asking all this other stuff so i leave there kind of like not yet like converted to the slipknot army just like they seem like nice fellows and then later <laughs> on as i would get more into the the band i was just like and every everybody's like oh my god Corey taylor he's so fucking serious oh fuck right, i'm like right, actually right. he's really funny <laughs> so it took a few years from your shows your acoustic gigs to really show that side of you that i got to meet that night right, that right. um you know that that hilarious that hilarious dude but what's interesting is that every time I even joke about Slipknot, I'm like, yeah, South Park, Slipknot should cover this. And all of a sudden, like a dial, you're like, Slipknot are a very serious band. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so so when I heard your previous solo album, I was like, fuck, it is so cool that here's that dude I met all those years ago on right. fucking Front Street. Like, you are having fun in that last album. And then when I'm listening to this album, I'm like, it's more serious, but that dude last time is still fucking there. So it just right. seems like you can do whatever the fuck you want, stylistically, spiritually, everything these days. And that's why I love about the new album, because I hear the Nine Inch Nails. I hear the kiss. I hear all of it. Mm. Oh, right on. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, at this point, doing the same thing just doesn't interest me, mm. you know, like 
And I'm like that. I mean, me and the guys in Slipknot are very much the same way. You know, like if we're not, if we're not feeling something, then we tend to, you know, we tend tend to get away. If we, especially if we feel like we've done it before, you know. Mm-hmm. And with the with my first solo album, you know, even though these were a collection of old songs, you know, like mm-hmm. stuff that I've just kind of been kind of been haunting my closet for God knows how long, it was still a side of me that maybe not a lot of people had ever really heard before, mm. you know? And yeah. I was just, I, it was just time for me to kind of dust those, that stuff off and put it out there, you know? And, and then heading into this one, the great thing that kind of fueled this album was going out and touring on that first album mm. and seeing how everything kind of, sat together with like everything that i was doing because i was doing stone sour songs i was doing slipknot songs doing covers you know we would do like acoustic stuff and everything fits so well together even in context with how out there that first album was it just it encouraged me to go okay i can dial this in yeah and i can really kind of focus this and go somewhere <laughs> creatively that maybe i hadn't even expected this to go Yeah, because the first album was like such a flute dude i was like if if I get to make one, that's it. That's cool. I've I've right. done it. These songs have 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 gotten a chance to be out there. People have heard them. Okay, now now what's next for me? You know. So mm-hmm. the fact that I got a chance to do CMF two and really be able to kind of fashion it into something that now has legs and has a direction, it's it's rad, man. I mean, you mentioned you know Kiss and Nine Inch Nails. There's stuff on there. There's some Pennywise vibes on this thing. There are, uh, but at the same time, there are hints of Slipknot. There are hints of Stone Sour. There's, you know, I've, my, my wife has been on me to do a proper (laughs) dark acoustic song forever, you know? So that's where Sorry Me came from was really Mm -hmm. just going, you know, okay. All right. You, you, if that's what you want, I mean, this, you be careful what you wish for, you know? So it's it's one of those things where the challenge is still there, but at the same time, it's it's stuff that just naturally comes out of me. You know, the challenge was really just trying to figure out how to kind of get it all pointed in one direction, heading towards the same thing, even though it was just so many points, like kind of all over. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and I think what's um what's great about this is that you know you. And I, and I, I have, a you know, I got to listen to the record a few times and I got to really, really like focus on some of the songs, but the thing that, that, that struck me right away was the way it starts. You know, you get a song like the box and right. all I want is that to continue. I know. Cause it's <laughs> just, so, I, it's, and it's like, why is this only two fucking minutes? And then of course, you know, it goes yeah. into something that is expected of you, but that is just so, and I'm like, why? Like, give me more of that. But in a way it's smart because it shows people it's a flex in a way, because it's like, you know, I can do whatever the fuck I want to do. And I'm going right. to give you a little bit of this, but, and it, it, I think it's, it's brilliant in a way to, to start off with that because it just sets a tone. And it almost reminded me of like a, of the way, like a Pink Floyd record would start, you know, like when you hear, oh, Pink, yeah, you know, like yeah. when you hear uh, uh, animals, you know, mm. you would, right. and it just starts the, and then it goes somewhere else. So it has that kind of vibe, you know, you mentioned animals and no, nobody talks about that album. It's one of my favorites. It's, a, it's my I favorite mean, Pink Floyd record. Even as, even as yeah. pregnant as some of those songs feel sometimes, man, mm-hmm. it just takes you yeah. someplace. So yeah, I, yeah. I definitely appreciate that. Um, that's the, that's the Pink Floyd record for me. Dude. Um, oh <laughs> yeah. 100%. That yeah. and the wall actually, like those yeah. two albums oh. are, are really the ones that like to me, every time I go back to Floyd, yeah. those are the two albums that I go oh. to, you know, especially because of the venom that comes out in some of the songs on yeah, Roger, Rogers, Rogers, so Rogers dark, pissed, you know, very. <laughs> and I mean, Roger Waters pissed is a whole other level of pissed yeah. because he's yeah, such yeah. a, a fricky <laughs> kind of dude anyway, that you're just like, Oh, <laughs> yeah. this is going to turn into violence here very quickly. You know? Um, um, I mean, the thing about the box and I agree, I mean, I dude, I could have, I could have leaned into that and riffed with that for an hour you know because i mean i literally wrote that the first day i bought a mandolin that's how oh, easy cool. that stuff is for me i did i immediately mm-hmm. just wrote that piece and i was just like well okay well there's the beginning of the album you know but and i tell this to my wife all the time man it's like that stuff especially is so easy for me that i tend not to go down too many like wormholes with it because i i can 
dude, I can write that shit forever. You and, know, you know, and and, and yeah. I, I, like I listen to, to to Breath of Fresh Smoke, and it's so uncharacteristically not you, but in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, when this guy gets too old. Right to do what he does with Slipknot, he'll be able to go in the <laughs> studio and write with younger people. Like you're, right. it just made me real. You're going to be around music for a long time because you do have that. If you are willing to share that, so. if you're willing yeah. to share that with other people, you could definitely write with people. Um, you could go into a room and write with younger artists that are looking for music because, like you said, it comes easily to you. Right, right, and and honestly, the the only thing that really interests me anymore is songwriting. You sure. know, like I love and 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 I don't mean that from because when people talk about like singer songwriters, they naturally go to Dylan or Springsteen or something like that. But there's such a difference. I kind of do it across the the gambit, you know, yeah. like I I try to run like just to kind of run the table when it comes to like when it comes to me being a singer songwriter. It is stuff like, you know, post traumatic blues. It is stuff like beyond. It is sure. stuff like sorry me. So it kind of fans the flames and leans into everything because that to me is the challenge is being able to take that singer songwriter mentality and apply it to all of these different s- styles of music. I mean, breath of fresh smoke, dude, that song is almost 20 years old. Wow. That's a very old song for me. And I, and it's one of the ones that I almost put on the first album. And I said, you know what? I'm going to hold on to this. It's the same with beyond right. Beyond was in a, in, a, in a couple of different forms, has been around for a minute, for me anyway. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't focused it yet because I hadn't really had the time because I was so busy writing all these other songs. So when the time came to kind of really focus on it, I kind of shredded it to the, to the sticks yeah, and kind of built it up again, you know? So, you know, it's that's the stuff that I, you know, when I'm when I'm physically unable to do a lot of the crazy stuff that, I do, you know, I would love to write with other, you know, other acts, other bands, other artists, because to me, that's, I still get pleasure from it. I still get the love for it. And it's, and that's the only reason why I do it is the love for it, man. I gotta, I gotta say, Corey, uh, you, you're always surprising me. You, you like a young Chris Jericho are very good at many different things. And I've seen you, (laughs) I've seen you as an, I've seen you kill it as an actor. I've seen you, uh, you know, move thousands of people. If you're a voice. But dude, until today, when I saw the video for Beyond, I did not know you could shred. So when yeah, did, when, yeah, yeah, yeah. When did you start I, uh, playing the solos, man? You know, a lot of the demos that I've done over the years, I've done solos for. You know, and honestly, I only and here's here's an interesting little tidbit. When I first started Stone Sour back in '92, um, it was really out of necessity that I was not only playing guitar the entire time but i was also playing lead mm-hmm. and uh it, it at the time the the kind of configuration that we had Sean Economaki was playing rhythm guitar we had a totally different bass player and Joel our old uh, you know our, our original drummer was he was the one that i had started the band with so when we would write songs together it was me and Joel Right. like jamming together, you know, and I would just naturally go into a solo bit. And I just continued to do that, man, like for the first handful of years that we were a band. And then, and then it just got, kind of got to the point where I didn't, I didn't want to do it. I wanted to focus on just being a front man, you know, mm. like, cause that's the fun. Yeah. Like you don't have to worry about, you know, your guitars in tune or <laughs> whatever. So kind of coming full circle to, to that in the solo thing is really funny because here i am in these you know with these two incredible guitar players zach and tooch and the solo for beyond i knew i wanted to keep and and do myself because i had written it years ago actually i i also did the solo for breath of fresh smoke in the demos yeah but i was like you know i would love to hear what one of these guys would come up with with, when it comes to something else, you know, and that's, you know, so I had Zach do it and Zach took it in this really beautiful, almost like, uh, like Allman brothers vibe, dude. Like it's Mm. so killer. Like where, cause whereas my original solo for that was very Irish. (laughs) Like I, I went in like this whole, I had this whole thing. Like if you would listen to it, you'd go, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's got red hair. Like there it is. (laughs) It's got red hair. I, I, I took it, you know, and and giving it to Zach, 
he really leaned into the more country tones that lend itself to that song. And I, and I just, he did such a beautiful job for with it. I was like, you know, that was 100% the right, the right move. But with beyond there's such a melody that kind of comes with that solo that I, I was like, you know what, I, that that's the one I'm going to keep for myself. And, you know, everybody else can, can do whatever they want with like the other songs, but that's the one I'm going to really, you know, kind of, do myself because i can just hear it it's such an earworm man you know yeah and all the solos i write have hooks like that they right. just have to be like that yeah and i think i think a good solo has to have a hook you know right every good right. every good solo has a hook um you know i it's no secret that you're a big big fan of pop culture um i know you're a superhero fan i know you're a music fan <laughs> um how yeah. are you feeling about superhero fatigue in terms of films now are you want because ryan and i are like we're both major superhero nerds um, right. we're, right. we're of the mindset of, you know, stop complaining because 25 years ago we had that fucking shitty Captain America movie. Are you there too? Yeah. I, you know, I was thinking about it the other day and I was thinking it right up until I actually saw guardians three, yeah. which restored my Thank you. faith. Yeah. Same. <laughs> and dude, that I cannot tell you, I was bawling my eyes out. The only movie that I had cried more than that movie was fucking end game yeah. for fuck's sake and i do it every time <laughs> i watch that goddamn yeah. movie it's just niagara falls coming out of my face <laughs> yeah, so yeah. um with you know with guardians 3 you know i walked into it and maybe it's because i had been kind of set up to really <laughs> enjoy it because of those movies right i i think that they've for some of these movies they've taken away what we enjoyed about them for, for the most part, I'm not saying there's fatigue. I'm saying that instead of kind of leaning into the characters, they're leaning in more to the directors. Yeah. Mm. And that in itself is taking away from where some of the, you know, the stories in the movies could go, you know? I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Eternals could have been great if it was 30 minutes shorter. Yeah. I think... Mm -hmm. I think Ant-Man, I think Quantumania could have been all right had they not spent the whole fucking time in green screen land, you know? I mean, they you don't even get to see Scott Lang's crew. Yeah. And yeah. that was one of the best parts about those fucking Ant-Man movies, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, I, you know, so I, have, so I have issues with some of this stuff. and But there are outliers, obviously. I liked what they did with uh, Wakanda Forever. Mm -hmm. um with i mean considering the circumstances sure. that was as good as it was going to get yeah um and i love the way that they've introduced namor and that can definitely play a role in what happens with fantastic four when that time yeah. comes yeah i i feel like now with guardians three i think marvel has seen that there is a beautiful compromise that happens when you do have the right director but the director has the proper respect for the, you know, for, for the property, you know, because I mean, James Gunn is one of the best in the business and what he did with those characters yeah. and with that story is, is, has not been touched. I mean, there's a reason that the fucking DC just went, take it, well, take it, it all. It, so, want you to fix uh, this shit. Corey, is I this, cannot you know, express yeah. how fucking good the flash is. Yeah. So it's, that's what I was going to say. Oh, dude, so I, don't, yeah, don't, we're not going to, I'm, I'm not going to tell I, you I, anything, but jealous we're not. as shit Listen, that you guys got to I got, see it. I, I got um, to see it last Sunday. Um, and I got oh. to see it in Toronto at a fan screening with Andy and Barbara Machete. Uh, and, oh and, shit. And okay. Let me tell you something, mm -hmm. dude. I, my bar has been set so low for the rest of this movie, you know, the rest of the movies that are riding out their contract, if you will, that right, I went in there right. like, this is going to fucking suck. And it right, was right. one of the best superhero movies I've seen. So yeah. I can't, well, I wait, can't for wait for you to see, to see it because you're going to love yeah. it. I'm going to lose my fucking yeah. mind. I, I might actually take my Twitter back and be like, you got to fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, there, there's a quote um, from Duff McKagan. Of course, Duff McKagan doesn't need any introduction. Uh, I saw Corey. Well, not a quote, but just a comment. I saw Corey. Who's command, that guy? I saw Corey command an audience <laughs> like a young Bruce Springsteen, acoustic guitar around his neck and truth telling through songs as his means of communication. It was truly inspiring. When you read that, when that was submitted for this letter that's included with the record, uh, how did you feel? Did you did you were you a little like verklempt? Yeah. Are you kidding me? I mean, there are not a lot of people 
in this business that I have more respect for than Duff McKagan. <laughs> um, not only is he one of my good friends, but he's, you know, I mean, in terms of just people who have not only seen it all, but they've been through hell yeah. and come back yeah. to live to tell about it, man. He's, you know, when you grow up watching somebody going, fuck, he's one of the coolest dudes in the world. And then all of a sudden his numbers in your phone. I mean, you, <laughs> yeah, it does yeah, things. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. It does things to your brain, you know? So, um, when he said that, when he wrote it, man, like that meant so much to me. Cause you know, I mean, I have not always been the easiest person to like in this business. Let's put it that way. Cause I'm, I'm very free with my opinion. <laughs> um, <laughs> putting it nicely. Uh, I, I tend not to hold back. I'm not a dick, but I think you're I'm honest. Definitely. You're not, honest. I'm not kissing anybody's ass, no. man. I don't have to, yeah. you know, like at this point, when it comes to music, I take it, I take this very seriously. And if something feels half-assed or, or, you know, below average, I'm going to fucking say something. So when I have somebody like that, saying what he does you know i mean it it you know i i try not to let the the ego balloon get yeah. a little too big you know i i try to pop it with as many needles as i can but but at the same time i mean that's a huge thing to live up to and and if i was you know i'd be lying if i didn't say that that's kind of where my vision lies with what i want to do as a solo artist man as a hint of springsteen hints of ozzy a lot of fucking, you know, a lot of Alice in Chains and vibes like that. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, I'm basically just trying to put my spin on everything that I've ever loved and doing it for an audience, you know? So it, it's it's rad to kind of feel, not only to feel the appreciation, but to feel it from somebody like him man, yeah. who, you know, he's been all over the world. He's in one of the, the biggest bands of all time. And he's just one of the best in the business. So yeah, it's, it's a, that's a mind fuck. <laughs> Corey, I've read, a have read a few of your books and uh, my favorite one is the one with like 50 words in the title about paranormal. Like what I learned about the app. Oh yeah. <laughs> a funny thing happened on the way to heaven. Yeah. 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 Um, and one of the <laughs> most compelling parts in the book besides, uh, you know, your, um, your hobby of ghost hunting is uh, the time you almost met Trent Reznor. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I, you kind of inspired me in a way to uh, fight through the fear of some of meeting some people I really idolize. Could you just uh, tell our audience exactly uh, what what happened there during the recording of Iowa? Oh, dude, it was at, well, it was Volume Three. Um, oh, okay, sorry, we my were, bad. Yeah. We had wrapped up. We had wrapped up at the mansion where we were mm -hmm. staying on Laurel Canyon, um, and and Rick Rubin still had a handful of things that he wanted us to record, so we moved everything to his house, mm, to his yeah. basement and his, his place up on, I think it was at the top of Miller. Anyway, we moved to his house and it was just a, it was very strange because it would, it would be me, Joey, Paul, uh, Greg Fiddleman clown would be there once in a while. Um, and that's honestly, it was in, in those sessions that we created the music for the nameless actually because that was something that me and paul musically had been working on we came up with the vibe for the virus of life and then that's where i kind of finished the vocals i, I finished the vocals for uh vermilion part two there and most importantly uh the blister exists and the day that i tracked the blister exists i got done and who happens to come to the house but Trent Reznor and I I, you know, I, I freaked out I was like because I'd never met him yet you know right. so and he's one of my biggest musical heroes ever you know I mean I'd be hard-pressed to say who'd be who would be a bigger influence on me Trent or Prince to be honest when it comes to like just the pure love for music the the output of music that he puts out there. So when I hear his name, I go, Nope, I got to go out. And, and there was a side <laughs> door. There was a side door to the studio um, that went, they came out of this, like this tiny little lawn on the hill that his house kind of sits on. And that's where you went to smoke. And at the time I, you know, I was still smoking. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll be, just let me know when he's gone, you know? So I go out and I'm smoking and I'm smoking my ass off. And, 
I smoked about two cigarettes uh, to the point where I was just like, you know, I can beat him. I can beat him. This is fine. You know? So and I go back in, he's already gone. <laughs> Come in. And it was crazy. Cause, and I look over and Joey and Paul and Philman are all grinning. They're all <laughs> just smiling. And I'm like, what? And it's like, well, we just played the blister exists for Trent Reznor. And he was so, he was so fucked up over it that he said, I got to go home and take a nap. And he left. And then, and, and I was just like, you miss that. <laughs> I was like, I was like, come on, how do I miss that? You know? <laughs> so, and then I met him later. How was it? And he couldn't have been, he could okay. have been the nicest person. I mean, he was so rad. Um, he stood and uh, watched, watched our whole show um, side of stage, dude. And, I mean, you want to talk about being nervous as shit. Yeah. I mean, there are not a lot of dudes that when they're side of stage, I I freak out a little bit. I've looked over and I've seen him. I've seen Patton. Yeah. I've seen Halford. Yeah. Like, those are the dudes that freak me out uh, when we're on the side of the stage. And I just go, oh, Christ, I sound like shit. I am shit. <laughs> like, yeah. Patton's, I Patton's like not viral. human. <laughs> Dude, you should have seen it. One night, he was... He was over on the side of the stage and it, w- it was right when Faith No More got back together. Yep. So this was 2009. Yep. They were out doing the, the reunited tour, yep. right? He would come out in the red yep. suit, yep. just looked fucking awesome. Yep. He was the man, you know, yep. <laughs> and we, he had come in a little earlier to Austria. We're in Vienna and, uh, well, no, no, it was Nova Rock. So we're getting, getting ready to do the jump up part, right? On spit it out. And he's like, he's looking at us, he's looking at the audience, like, what the fuck? And then I look over and he's starting to get down on the side and he's like, ah, all right. And then all of a sudden we jumped up and he shot up like a like a rocket, dude. And I just went, that that just happened. Yeah. Right did, did you see? Did you see? <laughs> did you see what happened? You know, I mean, it's little stuff like that that I remember so much. Yeah. And it just it makes me cheese because I'm just such a fucking fan. You yeah, know? no, and and that's the thing that comes across, man. Like I said it right when we got on here, passion. That's the one thing you have. Right. And you know, twenty whatever years in the business, you still have it. And I think that's what keeps you young. I think that's what keeps you hungry. And I think that's what keeps you interesting. And when you listen to this record, that all that is in there. You know, there's still a, right. a love thank for you. music. So, um, dude, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Absolute pleasure. The record's coming out in September. Uh, what do you do? September 15th. What are you doing yep. between now and then? Probably a thousand. Uh, right? God, what, mm-hmm. what am I not doing for Christ's sakes? Um, I'm going, uh, I'm going over to Europe with, uh, with Slipknot for some shows. Um, kind of running. We did the, we did the back half of the festivals last year. We're doing the front half this year. It'll be our fifth time headlining download, wow. dude, which is crazy. Yeah. yeah. That, that fucks with my head in a, a lot of different ways. We're doing that, uh, and then we have a couple of uh, U.S. shows that we're doing. Then in there, I'm gonna you know, be a dad, have some have some vacation time, and and really try to you know hang out with my family and stuff. <laughs> um, I'm actually we're taking the family to Hawaii for the first time, which is going to be really really oh, nice. cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, and then in uh, the end of August is when we go out with the 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 CMFT band. So we're gonna go out for about six weeks. And, uh, and then the album will drop right in the middle of that. So, uh, big, big to do going on. Um, they're already looking at booking us for some stuff over in Europe and the UK, uh, for, for CMFT. So yeah, um, busy as always. Um, I, I guess I'm just a psycho. I just love to do this shit, you know? <laughs> I, uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time to chat today. Thank you for doing the podcast and, uh, and continued success, man. And just keep killing it out there. So thank you, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Nice to meet you again, man. Oh, you too, man. Corey Taylor, a jack of all trades and a master of fun. He, and all uh, of I, I, I love his books. They're so funny. In fact, instead of writing a linear story, uh, he wrote like the seven deadly sins, an example of sins and stuff. And there's this one chapter where he's at a party and he's like, and I heard the audio book and it's great because his voice is really deep. And he's like, yeah. yeah, chapter nine. This is what I call the incident. And uh, <laughs> he was at a party and he 
just had sex and like his friends busting in the door and he decided to go and try to jump on top of them kind of like a crowd surf and he ended up hitting his face on the electric fan oh. <laughs> and, it, and it managed to hit him six times in a row in a millisecond and his face oh. was completely exploded his his books are amazing he has a book called you're making me hate you yeah um you know we recorded this a few weeks ago i'm actually curious to see what he thought of the flash because we were we were really yeah, excited we were, about it i still am i still am excited I still about am. The flash. me too um, but uh yeah no Corey, what's cool what's crazy about Corey too is that uh i don't know if we shared much about this but um i you know when i first moved to california um there was a guy who was really interested in managing our band. His name was Steve Richards. He worked at Epic Records, which is a division of Sony. Um, he was an A&R guy at Epic. He got wind of our album and uh, our EP that we had moved there with and wanted to see us. So I remember we went to go to his office at Sony in Santa Monica. And we went into the Sony building and we went into his office. And I'm not fucking kidding you. It was out of a movie. The guy was up on his desk jumping up and down on his desk, listening to pushing me. And he was like, you guys are the shit. I'm going to fucking sign you. You guys are the shit. I was like, wow, thanks. You know? And he had this really weird thing going on because he worked at Epic, but he managed this band called Slipknot. And they were about to be on Ozfest that summer, 99. And he goes, I managed this band called Slipknot. He goes, they're on Roadrunner Records. He goes, I got them signed to Roadrunner Records. He goes, and I'm and and I know I work at Sony, but I signed them to Roadrunner because they gave him a better deal. And he was managing them. And on our EP cover for um this EP that we did, uh, which is called Klepto, we have a picture of four guys in masks. And it's this festival that happened in Italy called the Festival of Lights. I'm not too sure which what it was, but it was a festival where people would wear masks and the mask kind of looked like, I will take that off, but I couldn't could get it off. But like, you know, kind of like those um, V for Vendetta masks, like just very plain white masks. Um, actually, you know what? I'll let me just find a picture of Klepto here. Here, throw okay. that up. Throw that up on screen. So you see that picture? See how we have the yeah. four? There's, so that wasn't us. That was just a stock photo that we found and we wanted to make that the cover. Well, when Steve Richards saw this, he thought we wore masks and he was like, I'm going to make you guys the next Slipknot. And this is right before Slipknot blew up, dude. They were like getting this popularity and the record had come out and Slipknot had an imprint label and they were looking to sign a band. And he said, you guys are going to be that fucking band. We had a falling out. We ended up going with another manager. He fucking hated us. Oh, hated shit. us. Hated us. And the band they ended up signing was a band called Mudvayne. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm like, it sounds like uh, he was trying to Mudvayne you guys. Yeah. Well, Mudvayne ended up becoming the band that Slipknot kind of took under their wing. Um, mm. I don't know if at the time it was to capitalize, I, maybe from the label's point of view or for whoever's point of view, they were trying to capitalize on what was going on with the, with the outfits and stuff. But we had this weird thing because he was managing them and... Um, it just got really nasty. And then when we were on Ozfest in 19, in 2000, Slipknot were supposed to come back and do Ozfest in 2000 and do the main stage because they'd done the second stage. They decided not to. They decided that they were going to go do their own festival called Tattoo the Earth. So they did their own festival in 2000. We did Ozfest. And, um, and there was just always this weird like thing between us and not Slipknot, but b between Steve Richards and so it was always a strange thing, but I remember when we, f when we met clown, he was super cool. And I met Corey years later when I started in radio and, uh, and he was just wonderful. You know, he was like, wonderful. And, and I, I, I think I told him the story about that. And anyway, Steve Richards ended up passing away. He had a brain aneurysm. Um, and it was really sad, but it's just funny how we had, like when we went to Ozfest in 99, we were offered tickets to go to the show because we were on Slipknot's, Slipknot's guest list. And it was Steve mm. Richards that put us on that guest list. And I remember we had just moved to LA two months, maybe three months. And then we played the outside pre-show camping party mm. in a parking lot. And then the year later we were on Ozfest. So it was just nuts. All that whole. So when I, whenever I talk to Corey and I see Corey and I think of Slipknot, it just brings me back all these memories of like that time. Cause we pretty much came up at the same time. You know, um, the only difference is they're the, biggest band on the planet and you know we're not and we weren't and that's <laughs> fine but it's just funny how you, you you just see how you you can be in somebody's life at one point and 
in their sphere, but you're not, you know what I mean? But we knew a lot of the same people. And, um, but man, that guy, I remember seeing him on a small stage on Ozfest on the second stage. They weren't headlining the second stage. They were, I don't think they were headlining. I think they were just rotating like everybody else did. And they were just unfucking stoppable dude. And there was no, t- t- not too many bells and whistles. It was just, you know, cloth, red jumpsuits and masks and them and just fucking carnage and loud and it was just crazy and then as they progressed and every tour got bigger their masks got cooler their costumes got cooler and now when a slipknot tour goes out i mean i can't imagine how many buses and how many trucks and you know it's just it's it's mayhem and but man the hard workers you know and when he finally unmasked himself and i remember the first solo thing people heard was from the the spider-man movie he did a song i think it was one of the first things that he did was that Look, it was, was definitely bother. It was definitely yeah. bother. The music video for bother, and that's the yeah. first time you see him without his makeup on. And it's kind of a Corey Taylor song slash. It, it is a Stone Sour song because that was his yeah. band before Slipknot. Yeah, and uh, it was it was interesting to see it to like to see him again. But I'm just like I didn't recognize him because he wasn't smiling. Because I'm telling you, in person back yeah. then, he was yeah. such. To contrast the the stage persona was smiling. just such a friendly, nice yeah. dude. Yeah. So, yeah. Clown scared clown scared the shit out of me. I don't think I said hi to clown once that night. Said hi to everybody. I got everybody to autograph a ticket, including people that weren't even in the bands because I didn't know what who the, who the fuck anybody was. was. Yeah, so yeah, nice. yeah. I love but, it. But you know, it's uh, rest in peace, Paul Gray, because it was Paul Gray's birthday back then, and he's yeah. the last person I talked to. We talked to before we ended up leaving that night, and he was just there, drinking a big bottle of Jack Daniels. He was a tall guy, a very friendly yeah. guy, very nice guy, and. Um, him, Craig, who just, I think Craig just quit the band or something. Yeah. It was re- it was a really special experience and kind of like set a predecessor of how to treat people for the rest of my musical career. I'm like, well, if the if the big boys are going to treat you this well, I want to get to a position where I could treat somebody that well, too. I never fucking I, did. But, yeah. you know. But still, I mean, they're, 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 they're very, very down to earth guys. And I remember... Uh, many times seeing Paul backstage at shows that we were like, we were on tour and Paul would show up and he was always a really nice guy. So yeah, it's, um, it's cool. It's super cool. It's super cool that we had him on and I'm really, really glad that people got to hear this conversation. So yeah, yeah, man. Awesome. Um, we've got a lot of stuff coming your way. Uh, we want to let you know that we really, really appreciate all the feedback. Uh, we, we appreciate all of you subscribing. Uh, we appreciate you guys getting involved with, uh, all our giveaways as well. We're going to have a lot more of them coming, uh, on the show and uh, just stay engaged with us. You can find Ryan and I on social media easily. Um, you can find the page over on Instagram and uh, we appreciate all of you for being on this journey with us. Also a big thanks to studio house designs for um, being with us and uh, providing us with these great shirts. And of course, heartbeat hot sauce. If it wasn't for heartbeat hot sauce, we would not be alive because they really are the heartbeat of the Rockman power hour. A big thanks to my uh, co-host Ryan stick to our producer, Julia Kajerski, uh, to Corey Taylor for joining us today on the show, which was really, really fun. And thanks to all of you. We really, really appreciate you. And until next time, we'll see you on the Rockman Power Hour. Hey, thanks so much for supporting the Rockman Power Hour. We're almost two years strong and we absolutely couldn't do this without your support. So make sure you click on one of these links to find our entire playlist of episodes. And if you haven't subscribed yet, right over there. Hit it and you won't miss anything.